Hi guys, uh, Phil Mann here. This is the sixth installment of the Ashdown Live isolation videos uh, that's been re-recorded 24 months later just to basically celebrate what was an incredible, incredible weekend uh, for the music industry. Um, now, the the Ashdown Live uh, sessions, first of all, they came around because Mark and Dan Gooday at Ashdown gave me a call and said, listen, Philip, we've seen you on Scott's Bass Lessons, Bass Player Magazine, all that sort of stuff. Do you fancy going live on social media for an entire weekend, do a, a marathon of free lessons, um, and then uh, put a donate button on there and try and direct everybody's attention towards NHS Fest, which was this brilliant charity put together by Ben Pomfret, who was Liam Gallagher's manager, uh, to raise money for Britain's National Health Service. It was a massive success. It raised over two hundred thousand uh, pounds that I'm I'm really proud to have been a part of. Uh, it was a very small contribution, but it was valid. It was really really great. Um, what we didn't know from that weekend was actually it was the catalyst that would enable me to set up with Base in Mind, uh, which is my own little online tuition hub. It's uh, an academic platform for bass players that has. Books, bases, uh, interviews, articles, techniques, columns, reviews. It's all on there. Uh, it's a place to buy my books. It's a place to book up lessons with me. But it didn't exist. It didn't exist uh, before that broadcast. Um, now, we've come up to a second year anniversary. So I wanted to go back, re-record that information. Because at the time, I think I filmed it on a... Some of the lessons were definitely on an iPhone. They were terrible. Um, uh, I looked like, I think I've already said, very, very low resolution. Um, I was like little blocks playing a bass guitar. We're in HD these days. So um, let's go back. Let's make them slightly better production. Uh, and then raise some awareness for with bass in mind for you guys, which is which is great. And that's, that's why I'm here. Um, the hopefully you've enjoyed the five lessons up to now. This is episode number six, and it kind of runs in hand in hand in tandem with episode number five. So if you've not seen that one, go back and watch that one before this one, because they kind of both go hand in hand. Now, um, episode five was about triads. Uh, there's only four types of triad, major, minor, augmented and diminished. And I suggested different ways of playing them and move them around the cycle of fourths, which was wicked. OK, lots of fun, lots of things to get your hands on. Um, what's really great about those exercises is that they're very purposeful. Triads are something that you see an awful lot of in the music industry when you're writing bass lines, composing solos, all that sort of stuff. Um, and then playing them around the cycle of fourths it is, is a great, great exercise that you can then utilise uh, in loads of songs because m songs tend to move in movements of fourths. That's the idea. They go hand in hand. So go and have a look at that. Um, we are going to refresh uh, and reinforce some of that information now uh, because obviously it's a short video, talking very fast, trying to get all the information out. It's nice to slow down and go over it again. Um, so we do that at the beginning of this lesson. But then in this session, we're also going to talk about the rhythm changes. OK, um, and this is a title that a lot of people know about. A lot of people don't know what it is, where it came from or how you use it and what its relevance is. Um, so that's kind of what this little session is going to be about. It's about just touching on the rhythm changes, letting you guys know what it is and why you should study it. All right. Because uh, you should. It's really good for you. OK. And it is also uh, the subject of my second book, if you wish to purchase it. OK, right now with basinmind.com. Uh, right. OK, right now, let's, let's, let's talk about, first of all, the cycle of fourths. The cycle of fourths is a great system that's evolved from the cycle of fifths. OK, question. What's the cycle of fifths? Well, the cycle of fifths is the bit at the beginning of every piece of music uh, that looks like a bunch of hash symbols. They're sharps and little bees with their noses turned up. They're flat symbols. OK, so sharps and flats. They're what allow you to establish the key signature. Um, there's seven sharps, seven flats and the key is C. And between them, it allows you to play in every single position on the bass guitar. OK, cool. So if you can play in every key, you can transpose a piece of information into loads of different areas and become fluid. That's great. OK. But we don't see the, the fifths an awful lot in music. We come into contact with fourths. That's when a chord like in the blues goes to one to a four or a two five movement in a two five one. OK, talk about that a bit more. But a fourth is a very common movement. So if we can kind of take the cycle of fifths 
and evolve it and refine it a little bit into a cycle of fourths, which is the same order backwards, we actually get an exercise which is very, very usable. Okay, first of all, cycle of fourths. If you start on any note of your bass, I'm going to start on C, and then do an interval of a fourth, which is the same fret on the next string, if you just want a very quick go-to way of doing it. What happens is you go around an entire cycle. See what I'm doing? And eventually, you come back to where you started from. That's brilliant. So, cycle of fourths, starting point, stack intervals of fourths, and you come back to the same place. Do it in reverse, and stack intervals of fifths, and it does the same thing, but the fourths is more relevant to contemporary music. Brilliant. That's the cycle of fourths. We're going to be using that in this session, okay? Um, again, go back, review the cycle of fourths. There's loads of stuff on fourths on the net. Go and Google it. Go and check it out. But we're going to do the cycle of fourths in hand with something that's referred to as the rhythm changes. Right. So this is the bit where we then answer the questions. What on earth is the rhythm changes? All right. So it's good. Well, uh, back in 1930, this is pre TikTok. Be warned. Um, back in 1930, there was a great composition uh, that was published and it was written by a guy called George Gershwin and the song was called I Got Rhythm. It went... That's I Got Rhythm. Uh, it was kind of like top hat and cane and jazzy hands, that sort of stuff. It was a theatre show. Um, it was actually featured in a musical called Girl Crazy, Okay. Go and Google that as well. You know, you've got to know where you've been in order to know where you're going. So do some research on that. George Gershwin, I Got Rhythm, Girl Crazy. 1930. Okay, right. So long ago. Um, right Now, the thing was, was that that chord progression that was in that song actually went on to influence hundreds of other songs. Now, there's a book called The Real Book, which is normally... There you go. There's the back of my head, guys. Um, right, there it is. This is the real book. This is a very old copy. My real book is full. If anyone would like to buy me a new copy of the real book, uh, I'm taking donations. Uh, my address is, um, yeah, this is the fifth edition. Um, I've had this years and years. Actually, I normally date all my work. Um, and there's a date in here that says 1999. Ouch. Um, okay, right now, the real book, fifth edition. Inside this book, there is loads and loads of compositions, okay? Um, and they've got all these names like Olio, Four, uh, Solar. These are just jazz compositions by the likes of, you know, Miles Davis, John Coltrane, that stuff. There's also The Beatles is in here, yeah? Yesterday is in here. So it's not all jazz, guys, but all the songs that are in this book, they um, delicately filed on the floor, um, they all reference some sort of principal uh, chord progressions. Now, chord progressions are obviously how chords interact with one another. And certain chords are more prolific than others. In the rhythm changes, I Got Rhythm, George Gershwin's is classic from the 1930, Girl Crazy, we spoke about that. There's two big chord progressions. The first one is the A section, okay? The A section is a 1, 6, 2, 5. It uses that chord progression. Here's 1, 6, 2, 5. Now that already sounds like hundreds of songs that I've heard because I don't listen to anything modern. Okay, right, so 1625. Um, that's the A section. There's some other chords in there, but that's the main meat and potatoes of the A section. The B section was a sequence of dominant chords. Okay, dominant chords, we'll talk about those in a minute. Um, but they were a sequence of dominant chords. Moving in fourths. Ah, cycle of fourths. All right. Now, here's a little thing that you don't need to know, but I'm just going to throw it in there for good measure. Whenever you see a dominant chord in a chord progression, you can do uh, a thing. You can reharmonize it and you can shove a two chord in front of it. That's called a subordinate uh, change. OK, so a subordinate substitute is two chord, which is a minor seven chord. You can put that in front of five. People commonly do this to the B section of I Got Rhythm. So where it was all dominant chords moving around a cycle of fourths, okay? See what I did there? It's like Mr. Miyagi, wax on, wax off. Okay, there's the dominant chords. You can now put two chord and go two, five, move, two, five, move, two, five, move, two, five. And what you end up doing 
is playing a, a complete sequence of two fives in every single key, um, which is awesome. It becomes this really credible academic exercise. Why? First of all, two fives are in every single song of that book that's on the floor, okay, in the real book. They're everywhere. It's not a little bit. Every other page, every other measure has got a two five. So you as a bass player, you need to be bulletproof at playing two five chord progressions. Okay, I can see where it's going. If you use the B section to I Got Rhythm, which are all dominant chords, chuck a two chord in front of them, you can now play two fives around the cycle of fourths. And that's the bit that people commonly refer to as rhythm changes. That's it. So I got rhythm, this masterpiece that George Gershwin recorded nearly a hundred years ago, went on to influence millions of songs. And it was all because two five, those chords. My bass is still out of tune. I recorded the last lesson and I still haven't tuned up. Sorry. Um, right, so it's good. I'm not going to do it now. Um, right, so it's good. No. So here are two fives. Now, let's now break this down. So we've got, I got rhythm. The A section is a one, six, two, five. Ah, two, five. There's one in there as well. The B section was a load of dominant chords. If you chuck a two chord in front of it, you can play them as two fives and they go around the cycle of fourths. Two, five chord progressions is what influenced every single song pretty much in the in the real book so one of the things that you hear an awful lot is someone will say hey uh michael steve john kerry whatever the student's name is um practice this around rhythm changes and they just use rhythm changes as a title and what they mean is around the cycle of force it's as simple as that now um i'm going to give you a great exercise and it's based upon the b section to Rhythm changes, you know what I'm talking about now. Um, and it's about the delivery of two fives. Okay, right. First of all, a two chord. A two chord is a minor seven chord. It sounds like this. There you go. That's a minor seven chord. I love how I sing a note that's not even part of it. Okay, right. There's my minor seven chord. Um, that's the harmonic presentation. You're going to play it melodically which is that, that's a minor seven arpeggio. First finger on G, fret three of string four. Little finger can play B flat, which is fret six of string four. That's the root and the flat three. Perfect fifth is uh, D, fret five of string three. And then F is fret three of string two. And that gives you a minor seven arpeggio. Cool sound, right? Here's mine. And as you can hear, if you heard that chord, you could use those notes of the arpeggio to create a bass line, solo, fill, whatever you can do. It's the perfect vernacular for a bassist. That's me. Okay, right, there you go. That's the two chord. Now, whenever you play a two chord, they are normally then succeeded by a five chord. Five chords are dominant. Okay, dominant chords sound like this. They're the guys that get used in the blues load, you know. Such a great sound, man. Um, there is our dominant chord. It consists of the notes of root, major third, perfect fifth, and a flattened seven, dominant seven. So here's the minor seven. Here's the dominant seven. And when you play them together, you get a two five chord progression. The most infamous and employed chord progression on the planet, other than a one four five, which is in the blues, all right? There's the footnote. Okay, how do you play a dominant arpeggio? Right, dominant arpeggio is this. Put your middle finger on C, guys. Fret three of string three. There it is. First finger then plays E, fret two of string two. Little finger plays G, fret five of string two. That's the major triad. And then we're going to play the seventh. Do you notice the presence of a triad then? Huh? Uh, root, major third, fifth, flat seven. That was a reference to the previous lesson, in case you're only watching this one for the first time and not that one. Uh, root, major third, perfect fifth, flat seven. There's a dominant arpeggio. Great, man. Right, okay, so now our two chord is a minor seven. This is G minor. Our five chord is a C7. Dominant. 
It's like they sound like a walking bass line, isn't it? Two five. Okay, right. Um, now, the exercise, what we're going to do today, is that I want you to be 100% fluent with playing two fives. That's it. That was the two chord, minor seven. This is a dominant. Seven arpeggio. Um, why do you need to play them? Because they're in the rule book. They're in thousands and thousands of songs. Being able to play a 2-5 chord progression is absolutely imperative. Okay. How do I ensure then that you can play them in every single key? So if you hear a song and it's a 2-5 in A, you can play it. If it's a 2-5 in uh, B flat, you could do that. If it's 2-5 in C, you could do that. Okay. How do I get you fluid? Well, I use rhythm changes. Okay, now, uh, try and keep up if you can. <laughs> Might be a good time to stop. Go and make a cup of tea uh, or a coffee if you're from New York. Come back and then press play again. Uh, now, remember the cycle of fourths. Now, we did this in the preceding lesson and we're revisiting it again now. What I want you to do on the cycle of fourths is quite simple. You're going to go... Start on C and play a 2-5. Then you're going to go to F and play a 2-5. Then you're going to go B flat and play a 2-5. You see what's happening? Then you go to E flat and play a 2-5. And then you go to A flat and play a 2-5. And then D flat. Um, try and play a 2-5 and then B and play a 2-5 2-5 from E, 2-5 from A then from D and then you go back to C it means you can play the sequence in any key alright, that's awesome that's such a great exercise and it's the one that you're going to get from this lesson so let's do it together, let's just work through it and I'm going to show you how the exercise is actually constructed um, start on C, okay and that's going to be your 2 chord you're in the key of B flat, but we're on the two chord, which is C. We're just using that as a, a landmark. Still does the same thing, guys. You play it in all keys. So play your minor seven arpeggio. Now, whenever you see a two, it's subsequently followed by a five chord, a fourth above it. So that's F. So you go C minor, F dominant. That's our first two five. Okay, now you've played the F. Make the F minor. So you now move from C to F. So we're on F, make it an F minor. And then if that's the two chord, it's five is B flat. So you've done C minor to F dominant. F minor to B flat dominant. Okay, now you're on B flat, make B flat minor. Play B flat minor and then go to E flat dominant. Now make E flat minor and go to A flat dominant. Now make A flat minor. You can see what I'm doing. I'm just repeating this exercise to D flat dominant and D flat minor. So G flat dominant. That's why I made a mistake last time. Um, G flat becomes minor to B dominant. And then B dominant becomes B minor. So you notice that I'm basically going 2, 5. Make the 5 a new 2 chord, 2, 5. Make the 5 a new 2 chord, 2, 5. So minor, dominant, minor, dominant, minor, across the entire thing. And you get this. How cool is this as an exercise? Now, what's really great about this exercise is you're now playing 2, 5 chord progressions. Ah, where am I? Uh, minor. Yeah, oh, there it is. <laughs> I can't play and talk at the same time, guys. Cut me some slack, all right? Now, um, you're playing... 2-5 chord progressions in every single key which means you're going to be completely fl fluidic with them you can you'll be able to play them in any song should you be confronted with that that uh you know uh, situation um this is mega uh now the the whole subject of playing two fives around the cycle of fourths uh in or around rhythm changes you know now um in loads of different keys and then playing that voice led, which means this. Check it out. Notice how the arpeggios is one continual ascent. That's the subject of the second book that I did, Core Tone Concepts, Volume 2. Okay. Uh, now, that's essentially lesson five of this program. Okay. This is Excavation of the Humble Triad, um, Volume 2. 
uh, is the, uh, what was it, the Transcendence Form <laughs> Intent to Implementation. And these are both available through With Base in Mind. So if you get a chance, go and check them out. Um, order them. I, I have food that I need and bills to pay. Uh, so please buy my books. Um, uh, but yeah, it's all there. Guys, um, this is a great lesson. It's a great lesson that you can use if you're into jazz or not. It's the cycle of fourths and it's about delivering a 2-5 chord progression throughout the entire sequence. Um, and it all came from rhythm changes. So food for four, next time you learn a scale, like the C major scale, why don't you go and play it around the rhythm changes? C, F, B flat, see what I'm doing? E flat, A flat, D flat. Next time you learn Dorian, why don't you go practice it around the rhythm changes? Dorian, F, B flat, <laughs> A flat, ah! A flat, E, etc., etc. Go and learn those stuff, okay? Practice around the, the uh, rhythm changes, the cycle of forps. Why? Because you're going to play it in every single possible key. And the movement that you're doing will mimic the movement that you're probably going to get confronted with in hundreds and hundreds of songs. Blues, funk, jazz, they all move in fourths. So it's incredibly relevant. So that's really good. Guys, I'm Phil Mann. Thanks so much for hanging out. This is the sixth installment of Ashdown's live isolation videos. Um, thanks a lot to Mark and Dan Gooday of Ashdown Engineering for all their love and support. Um, have a good one. Uh, and if you get a chance... Press like. Uh, I need your subscriptions. Uh, and uh, and I'll see you down the road. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye-bye.